Kia ora, te lofa lava, kia rana, welcome. We do it in all sorts of ways, sitting or kneeling in an uncomfortable pew, half awake or half asleep, walking on a beach or in the bush, stroking our pet cat or our neighbours. We do it in empty churches and full, in the solace of our bedroom, or around the dining table with people important to us. We do it singing or in silence. Some do it when they paint or knit, build or play. As for what we're doing, sometimes we can describe it and sometimes not. The usual word for it is prayer. But that word doesn't tell us too much. Sure, when we're younger and think the world makes sense, we might describe prayer as talking to God, which kind of assumes that we know what and where God is and how to talk to God. But as we grow older, all of that becomes less certain. And besides, if we say that God is omnipotent and omniscient, doesn't God already know what we think before the words are out of our mouths? So why bother with talking? What's the use of it? Not that I'm trying to talk you out of prayer. It's just that prayer doesn't fit within the boundaries of our usual discourse or modes of exchange, just as God doesn't. And if you give up on the idea of God as a feudal king who dispenses favours to the subservient, then you also might want to give up on the idea of prayer being the petitioning of such a being. What's the use of it is actually a really good question. If it doesn't achieve anything, anything tangible anyway, why persist with it? Isn't it just useless? Well, maybe we should ask this differently, like, does everything of value to us have to be useful? Maybe there are a whole lot of useless things in our lives that actually make living pleasurable and meaningful. Do we, for example, plant, pick or smell flowers because they're useful? Maybe the planting, picking and smelling are like a prayer, celebrating and adding to the beauty in the world. Do we, for example, raise children or grandchildren in order for them to be useful to us? I hope not. I hope our answer would be closer to a prayer of giving love for no reason whatsoever save to give love. Love without why. Do we, for example, come to church to meet, sing, think and pray with others in order that it is useful? I come to church because I believe and have experienced a deep rhythm of thankfulness in life and I want to carry that beat in my mind and heart and make a symphony of music with others carrying that beat. Which is, by the way, how I reimagine that story of the Samaritan leper who experienced a healing in Luke 17. I think somehow, even though he lived outcast, even though he lived with the indignity of having to shout a warning to anyone who came close, even though he did not expect inclusion, he knew of that deep rhythm of thankfulness, maybe nurtured by some love he had experienced, so that when he received an unexpected gift, from Jesus, his instinct turned to that rhythm, 
and he joined and participated in it. The divine is like a rhythm pulsating in the depths of life and given expression when we in time join in, when we express thankfulness by word, deed or sigh, when we express loving affection by word, deed or sigh, when we express beauty by word, deed or sigh. This is prayer. And Christianity or any religion does not have the ownership rights to prayer. If it belongs to anyone, it belongs to the whole world, the oikumene, the whole inhabited household of the earth. Prayer is not some holy language to address a holy deity separate from the secular earth and its creatures. Prayer is not some religious exercise divorced from the rest of one's life. Rather, prayer is as natural as breathing, and God as accessible as the air we breathe. I was reading a collection of classic prayers the other day. The editor had written in the preface, I am very bad at praying. I don't find it easy, and most of the time I don't find it pleasurable. I just find it hard work and not very rewarding. I find such a statement, let alone a statement in a book of prayers, very sad. Prayer has been shaped into a category removed from this editor's everyday life. Yet it was not always and everywhere like this. There are many cultures in the world where daily tasks have been traditionally accompanied by prayer. In Celtic spirituality, for example, there is a sublime unity of life and divinity, where one breathed and toiled and lived into the rhythm of thankfulness, love and beauty. Similarly, Māori spirituality integrates the sacred with everyday living. In washing, preparing, cooking, planting, tending, caring, hunting, gathering and sleeping. Prayer, so spoken or silent, was a part of the rhythm of life, connecting with a deeper rhythm. Morris Shadbolt gives this definition of prayer. There's only one reason to pray, and it is not to petition or to please. It is, as it was in the beginning, to get a grip on our existence, or to flag it down for a moment as it flies past. We also win a little harmony from the human bedlam that is serendipity. Following short paragraphs, I once wrote, titled Morning Prayers, give glimpses into how that grip on our existence happens in everyday lives. Dressing gown and slippers at dawn, stirring the porridge, caring for his soul as the little ones stir awake. The earnest believer opens his Bible, reads the prescribed text and talks to God. God is kind. Walking around the rocks, rod in one hand as the day kisses the night to dew. The sea holds her other hand and her heart. The same earnest believer grows tired of talking at God and stops to listen. God listens too. The child runs, jumps into the double bed and cries, I love you, mummy. The warmth of uninhibited love floods her soul. The warmth of the cup warms more than his hands wrapped around it. It is a moment of nurture and today... A moment of contemplation. They meet for breakfast every workday morn at six. It's a big breakfast for big men who lay big slabs of concrete for cars to park upon. It's not the food, 
rather the camaraderie which feeds this soul. They meet before breakfast, gathered in the front room, doubling as a chapel. They use a liturgy full of old words written by others about others. Doesn't make sense. But they gather anyway and leave feeling held. The dog sniffs at everything. It is curiosity incarnate. It is very sociable, indiscriminately greeting each and every early riser on the city streets. The woman enjoys being led by the dog into the day and into her soul. Each of these brief vignettes captures something of the prayers being offered up every day by innumerable people. They're offered in darkness and in light and trouble and in joy knowingly and unknowingly, for ourselves and despite ourselves, prayers of thankfulness, love and beauty. It's also difficult when talking about prayer not to slide into poetry. When talking about spirituality and matters of the soul, after a while the logic, the language of logic, the language of sensible, becomes inadequate and arid. Poetry seems a better medium. Indeed, probably the most enduring prayer book in the English language is the Anglican 1662 Book of Common Prayer. So beloved because of the poetic nature of much of its language, despite its antiquated and frankly terrible theology. Another great vehicle for keeping time with this deep rhythm is music. Here one does not have to be encumbered by the limitations of language. There are many of us who revel in the power and beauty of well-performed music to embrace and nourish our souls in ways that are difficult to describe. The music's lyrics are largely incidental. Indeed, the lyrics, for example, when extolling a patriarchal god, just get in the way. Many of us in Western society live under constant bombardment from words. From the moment we get out of bed, from remembering and making decisions, from emails and newspapers, from organising and listening to others, our brain is going frequently flayed by information and demands. The volume of noise can be tremendous. It's civil then not to come despondent about prayer if it is just one addition to that collection of sounds, one more clang in the cacophony, one more date in the litany of demands. But on the other hand, there are a variety of non-verbal, renewing experiences that can happen every day. When one pulls open the curtains and inhales the light of the morning sun. When one walks, runs or swims and feels the body's movements and pleasure. When one sips and smells the aroma emanating from a cup. When the warm wash of empathy floods over us. When the fire burns low in the grate and the glow warms the soul. Each of these experiences connects us with the deep rhythm, that deep rhythm of thankfulness, love and beauty that we name as divine. Each of these are experiences are as if a prayer. So it's no wonder people do it. When they do it, either knowingly or not, which is another thing, in all sorts of places, in all sorts of ways, with all sorts of people, or just alone. We carry and keep this rhythm, we pray this rhythm, and in doing so there is hope. 